Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Well, we have some breaking news for you out of federal court in Calgary. Two First Nations women are suing the federal government. They're alleging systemic racism is widespread across several Indigenous agencies and departments. The claim was filed just hours ago and seeks $25 million in damages. APTN News reported on the struggle to get racism in the civil service under control back in the spring. For the whole story, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Well, the latest COVID outbreak in the Northwest Territories is affecting multiple regions. In Yellowknife, those experiencing homelessness are battling the virus with much needed supports to, uh, cut off. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs brings us the latest in that story. These uh, shelters and these uh, services are actually like a safety net for the majority of the people on the streets and uh, they rely on it. The latest victim in the Northwest Territories COVID-19 outbreak, the street involved of Yellowknife, who come here for a meal, a shower, or simply for shelter. The day shelter and sobering center are now closed indefinitely after many healthcare workers, shelter staff, and clients contracted the virus. See how angry he is? He's yeah. mad, like he wants in, he wants, like where is he gonna go, look. He's just walking away. You know I mean? Michael Where's Fat, a frontline worker and advocate, says the fallout for clients, broken trust. Can we rely on these services? Can they always, will they always be there? And it's like, when this happens, it just, it just basically breaks that trust with them. The Reese says COVID-19 spread quickly through the shelter. They were carrying a backpack on their back, hiding booze in there, and then they were just running to the washroom and sharing their drinks with the next person they want to drink with. The territorial government says they're in talks with the city to open an emergency day shelter in an arena. I have taken note of the criticism. I know people say, why weren't we better prepared? Um, we, I feel like we were prepared, but what we hadn't factored in was, or what the Disabilities Council as the operator hadn't factored in, is that all the staff could be sick at once and we would need a whole replacement. Minister Julie Green says the GNWT is accommodating those who need a place to isolate in a nearby hotel. We uh, seem to be managing okay in the isolation centre now. We, we realise that you know, it's tenuous. If we have a, a you know, an, a big increase in cases uh, where we run out of space at the isolation center, then we're going to be looking for more space for temporary accommodation. But even before the outbreak, clients were turned away from the shelter because of limited capacity due to COVID-19 restrictions. On Monday, the GNWT announced they'd selected this location as a new temporary day shelter this winter and are beginning consultations with neighboring businesses. For FAT, he says there's room for more input I, I from frontline staff. The, these places, like they should have a built-in program, a sy system for each and every individual. They should have identified the, the challenges, identify the problems, and then, and then step them up. Not just say, okay, fill out this paperwork. Never mind, uh, fill the paperwork out for them. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. It's the last day to register to vote by mail. Michelle Karlinzik has more on how organizations are helping Indigenous people get out and vote. As Election Day nears, some deadlines are closing for Canadian voters. Today at 6 p.m. is the last day Canadians can register to vote by mail. Sending the ballot in the post can be a better option for people living in remote areas but not everyone is in their home communities. There are currently about 1,500 wildfire evacuees living in Winnipeg hotels. As far as voting goes, evacuee support staff Jackie Anderson says it's the last thing on their mind. You know, as a community, we're just so busy right now, you know, just delivering that heart medicine work of, you know, caring for our community, um, our northern our northern relatives, and that, uh, you know, to be honest with you, we never really thought about the voting um, and what that's going to look like for them. But, you know, when I think about even just with vaccines and with medication, um, you know, even the challenges of being able to get a vaccination card, you know, because uh, they either don't have access to internet or, um, you know, again, their, their addresses in their First Nations community. 
Anderson says this next week, Mama Way hopes to work with the Red Cross to help evacuees get out and vote. Native Women's Association of Canada released a 79-page analysis conducted by Nanos Research, scoring the major political parties in relation to priority areas set out by NWAC. Missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, along with policing and justice, are just some of the areas looked at. CEO of NWAC Lynn Grew says they put more effort than ever into educating Indigenous people on the election. We really want uh, people to think about engaging this year, casting that vote, because if we don't, we're leaving all these very serious human rights issues for the future. So we say, you know, we, let's have an impact and let's get out there and vote. Federal There's leaders tackled Indigenous issues in last this, week's debate, and Gru says she hopes it's a record turnout. We will see on the election day and uh, the results. So um, uh, as I said, like I'm really hoping, and in particular for Indigenous women, I think it's uh, we need to have our voices heard. And this is one of the ways that we can do that. You can find more information on voting at electionscanada.ca. Michelle Carlenzing, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Residential schools and the abuse inflicted by religious staff members are very much in the news again. A group of Inuit men, including longtime advocate and elder Peter Ernick, wants to bring former priest Johannes Revoir to justice for allegedly abusing Inuit children back in the 1960s and 70s. Here's Ernick talking about how his friend Marius Tungalik started a decades-long quest to have Revoir extradited from France. And he started to talk about having been sexually abused by um, um, Johannes Rivois uh, when he was a priest in late 1960s, when he was a young man, young bo young youth um, uh, in Nauyak Repulse Bay. And um, so we got talking about all this, and we decided uh, that we would, the three of us, would take on the world. I think uh, they would all be happy to see him uh, to be brought to court, stand trial, and uh, answer for his actions, and uh, be put in jail for life. That uh, that would be that would be uh, the end objective. This has worked extensively on this story, and she joins us now. Thanks for being with us, Kathleen. So tell us about this former priest, Johan Rivoire. Yeah, so he's living in the south of France. He's retired. He was a Catholic priest working in Nunavut. And it was in the 1960s and early 70s. So this is a historical case. And in these kinds of cases, as you know, many of these victims come forward later in life when they're adults and that's what happened here uh why hasn't there been why hasn't he been put on trial this mr uh johannes i guess i think i said his name wrong revoir why hasn't he been put on trial like other priests well that's a very good question what happened was by the time rcmp laid criminal charges against him he had left and gone to france so then Canada reached out to see if France would send him back to stand trial and learned that France does not extradite its citizens. Mm -hmm. So then this lingered on the books, these charges. And in 2017, Canada decided very little chance of a conviction. So it stayed the charges against him. But this just outraged these you know, alleged victims and many Inuit in Nunavut. Is there any chance of us getting him back here? Or these charges being, uh, you know, new charges being laid? Where, where does this leave us? Yeah, there is no new investigation, no new charges. My information, uh, that's what I received last week when I started looking into the case. But I'm told that uh, the government of Canada has hired a lawyer to see what else can be done. Mm -hmm. Could he be tried in France, for example? Uh, you know, there is pressure because a lot of these alleged victims are aging, some have died, and, you know, Inuit organizations are involved saying, could we use some of their statements that they gave to police when the charges were originally laid? Like, you know, let's get something going on this again. 
Well, and is there any conversation about, you know, maybe it's not a matter, a matter of Canada fighting France to get this guy to come back here for charges, but getting the Catholic Church to step in and do the right thing? Well, I have calls into them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have an, a way to answer that question, but the Inuit say the Catholic Church is under pressure right now because of these unmarked graves that mm -hmm. have been found across Canada outside residential schools. And so the government of Canada is under pressure too. You know, this is all a connected issue. These were all alleged crimes that occurred against children that had to go to these schools. They were forced to. Mm -hmm. And in, in doing so, awful things happened to many of them. And yet they say they can't get justice now, especially in this case. Well, Kathleen, I have a lot of respect for the work that you've done on this, on these stories for residential schools and survivors. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Melissa. We want to hear what you think about France and the Catholic Church protecting priests accused of abusing children. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us, of course, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and to see our latest stories. We're going to have to take a break, but here's a look at something that we're working on for you. I'm Sarah Connors at the White Horse Rapids Fishway, and coming up this week, I'll be taking a look at how declining numbers of Chinook salmon are affecting Yukon First Nations, and how these fish and other Yukon River salmon are an important issue in the upcoming federal election. It's important that in order to recover, we need to put our best efforts forward and get our priorities straight. That's coming up soon on APTN National News. Welcome back. Well, the checks have been sent out to the 60 scoop survivors for months now, all part of an $800 million settlement between them and the federal government. But a 60 scoop healing foundation was also part of that settlement. Very recently, a new CEO was chosen to oversee it. She joins us now. Jacqueline, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. You know, you've spent a good part of your adult life writing about and advocating for 60 scoop survivors. Why is that? Well, this area is near and dear to my heart. First and for foremost, I would like to say to survivors that you are no longer alone. For myself, my journey has been being a part of the 60s scoop. Specifically in Saskatchewan, we had the Adopt Indian Métis program, uh, AIM for short. And for myself, in my particular case, I was never registered for adoption. And I went in and out of foster homes until the age of 14. So 14 foster homes, and also I'm sure many survivors can relate, also endured a number of losses, a number of traumas, a number of uh, <laughs> identity um, issues, as well as uh, really questioned where I belonged or if I belonged here at all. So I certainly bring in the lived experience. And then along the way, many of my mentors and those that came before me encouraged me to really give voice to this experience, now known as the 60s scoop, also to write about it intensely. And importantly, research was one aspect, but research was really an inner search. It allowed me to find the answers to unanswered questions. And many of us go through our journey when people have asked us, who is your family? Where do you come from? Basic questions, who is your next of kin? What is your medical history? and so forth you know and i had a lot of shame and uncertainty and i wanted answers to those questions mm -hmm. so that started my inner search but that also was a springboard to my research and doing my doctoral work on the area of the 60 scoop and then later importantly it is not about me it is about capturing the stories of other survivors who have endured thousands of us have endured the uh, impact of the 60s scoop. So I've journeyed with and as well as mentored other survivors to encourage them to tell their story, to share their truth, to share in a, in a meaningful way from the heart, and then also talk a bit about what message they would like to pass on to other survivors in terms of their resiliency and their hope and their light. Is this so what an, part of the foundation is going to do for survivors too? just kind of increase that opportunity to heal and to share? 
Absolutely. And certainly uh, being a part of now our 60s Scoop Healing Foundation, we are going to do our best to create and also to implement programs and activities. And really importantly, the, the importance of one of our, our main messages, we're here to journey and accompany, you know, 60s Scoop survivors, as well as their family members, their descendants, and also mm -hmm. bring in a multi-generational perspective. In other words, you know, that we know similar to the residential school experiences that there are intergen intergenerational traumas but we also have intergenerational healing that we are stepping into and the healing foundation is certainly going to facilitate that and also you know importantly too that also means that with our our 60s group healing foundation that we are looking at how does that actually happen mm -hmm. cultural reclamation also reunification advocacy is a huge part education absolutely and importantly what i would call commemoration but commemoration is also celebration to say you know i celebrate and honor our 60 scoop survivors who are listening today because many of them have been under the radar, who many have been silenced and haven't had a voice or haven't even had the opportunity to be validated mm -hmm. that they no longer journey away. So that the Healing Foundation now, in terms of our implementation, will also have a rollout of a grant process in healing and wellness services across, across the nation. So we're quite excited. Well, we are thankful that you took time out to share this with us. I'm, I'm sure that 60 Scoop survivors are happy to see that this is all moving ahead. Unfortunately, we're not seeing it on the campaign trail as much as we'd like to, but we appreciate you taking the time to share this with us today. Great. The Quaitly First Nation is demanding Enbridge's natural gas pipeline be rerouted off their territory in northern BC. They sent a letter to the federal and provincial governments asking for an order to remove the pipeline from their lands and held a press conference about it today. The First Nations are, is already in a dispute with Enbridge. The nation has a civil suit against the company after a natural gas pipeline explosion back in 2018. The blast led to the excavation of their community. Their leaders expressed frustration with the negotiations uh, with, and Enbridge. They're now calling for the pipeline to be rerouted safe, for safety reasons. I really strongly that it's time Enbridge got out of got with a reconciliation program and started treating our nation with respect and the respect that they deserve. We have sent a letter this morning to the governments of Canada and BC ordering Enbridge to reroute the pipelines off of our reserve. While well, still in BC and still on the pipelines, a new report states the Trans Mountain Pipeline project will go over budget and be delayed well into 2023. According to the report by West Coast Environmental Law Association, the $12.6 billion project's construction costs will be millions over budget and could see delays for up to two years on some segments of the pipeline. The report is calling on the federal government after the election to immediately provide an updated cost estimate for the pipeline. There hasn't been an update since before the pandemic. After September 20th, when the new government uh, is formed, we would like to see a, uh, the reevaluation of the project, disclosure to start with of actual construction updates and cost estimates, uh, and uh, uh, the basis for having a, a, an honest conversation about the direction that we want to head together as a country moving forward. Uh, well, we've got more news ahead, but we need to pay, take a break right now. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This was sent to us by Janice Gladish. This doe and fawn regularly visit their property to gain access to some apple and some pear trees. I guess they decided to pose for a quick pic, too. You can send your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather. Off to the east coast, we got 19 for Charlottetown, Fredericton, Halifax, and it's raining in all those places. 12 for La Grande River and Cloud, Nain, 6 and cloudy. Valdor, 16 with some showers, same with Run Noranda. 22 in sunshine for Peterborough, 20 with mixed sun and cloud in North Bay. Cap is casing, 17 and showers, 22 in sunny for Thunder Bay. 
The Paw, 20 and showers, same with Norway House. 21 inch showers expected for Winnipeg, 24 with a mix of sun and clouds over in Brandon, 19 and rain for Swift Current in Saskatoon, 24 is for Regina and Yorkton and cloud there, rain in Stony Rapids and Uranium City, 11 degrees there, 12 in sunshine for Grand Prairie, 15 and showers for Fort McMurray, 13 in rain in Red Deer and Calgary, 19 in sunny in Medicine Hat, 16 in showers for Penticton, 17 and sunny in Campbell River and Vancouver. 13 in showers for Prince Rupert and Smithers. 14 and cloud for Fort Nelson. Mayo, 13 and showers. 13 and sunshine for Dawson City. Wati and Wrigley and Yellowknife and Norman Wells. Everybody is 11 degrees there. 13 in showers for Fort McPherson. Uh, 8 and mix of sun and cloud for Colville Lake. Chesterfield, 8 and cloud. Whale Cove, 9 in showers. Minus one in a glue look, uh, zero and sunshine for Clyde River. Well, turning now to the pandemic, beginning in Saskatchewan, where COVID-19 cases are once again surging. The province is renewing an emergency order to ease the strain on its health care system as the number of cases hits a new high. Health authorities are reporting the highest ever numbers of COVID daily 19 infections since the pandemic began. 89% of the 449 new cases are in residents who are not fully vaccinated. On Monday, the province renewed an emergency order that will allow the Saskatchewan Health Authority to redirect health care workers to areas that are under pressure from the pandemic. Well, and then next door, the number of people in intensive care across Alberta is at the highest it's ever been since the start of the pandemic. It's forcing hospitals in Edmonton to delay even more surgeries. I think we are in unprecedented territory. While we haven't yet canceled all elective surgery, we're on the pathway for that. 198 Albertans are in ICU being treated for COVID-19. Alberta Health Services says the majority of patients in ICUs are not fully vaccinated. 65 doctors, Alberta doctors, have signed a letter to uh, address to the Premier calling for restrictions for unvaccinated people. As of Monday afternoon, ICU capacity was at 90% across that province. Well, then over to BC, the government is putting some 150,000 healthcare workers on notice. Get vaccinated or else. The ultimate um, end for people who choose not to be immunized, who work in healthcare, is uh, a leave without pay. As of October 26th, anyone working in a BC healthcare facility from doctors, nurses, maintenance and janitorial staff, they'll all need to be fully vaccinated. Several unions that represent healthcare workers say they're concerned this could push more workers out of the healthcare system at a time that is already being stretched to the brink. Well, we are all out of time for your news this Tuesday. We're always thankful to have you join us here. I'm Melissa Ridgeon. We'll see you back here tomorrow.